You don't even have to ask your mom for quarters because we've got you covered as we look into how the video game film genre has evolved in today's episode. Howdy, I'm Jeff Goldsmith, and this is the Q&A. My agenda is simple. Each week, I plan to bring you in-depth insights into the creative process of storytelling. And folks, I'm pleased to have director Kyle Newman back in the podcast for his latest film, One Up. That's right. It's a video game genre movie, but this time it is about the eSports competitions that happen especially on college campuses a lot of people don't know that and we'll discuss it but yes you could get an esports video game scholarship to go to college and compete on these teams and be a part of this huge worldwide sport that a lot of people do know about but just as many people you could argue do not know about so it's it's very cool that there's a film finally highlighting it but done as a comedy so it's not it's not a documentary here folks and look without a doubt this is a silly film and and comedy is definitely a strong part of kyle's wheelhouse and he made this film pretty much during the lockdowns before vaccines were available and we talk about what it took to make a film on a low budget with tons of effect shots needed both uh for the video game footage itself and for some other things that he does in the film and for other reasons that you will hear of course while we're talking about this film it's on amazon prime you could go watch it right now and i hope you do and then you'll have an even better insight into our conversation about it as well without a doubt kyle was razor sharp regarding what it took to get this film made so i know you'll dig this episode and speaking of things to dig backstory magazine turns 10 that's right we survived a decade and we couldn't have done it without your help. And the other good news is that we just released a new issue. Yes, issue 47, our summer issue is live and there is so much great stuff in it. I hope you check out the table contents to see it all, but we have Emmy Awards contenders ranging from Stranger Things, Better Call Saul, Station Eleven, Barry, hacks and what we do in the shadows to summer movies to new scripts for you to read to an interview with director john carpenter on the 40th anniversary of the thing man there are so many great things in this issue and i hope you check it out if you have never read us before you can of course test drive us over at backstory.net and read the free issue or you could use the ipad app backstory where you could read the free issue there as well. And if you like what you see, and I hope you do, you could consider becoming a subscriber. And to sweeten the deal, I want to give you discount coupon code SAVE5. That will save you $5 off a one-year subscription. The code will work at backstory.net and you enter it there in your checkout cart, but it'll give you access to both backstory.net and the iPad app as well. So, you know, it's two for one. You get access to both easily. But look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and IT iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube channel, which is all the Zoom cast go of these interviews. So you could see us do the interviews. You don't have to just hear us, but it would really mean a lot to me to have you subscribe to my passion project. So thanks for considering. But now without any further ado, let's jump right into our conversation with director Kyle Newman about his latest film, which you could watch on Amazon Prime, One Up. Kyle, it's good to see you. How are you doing, man? Great to see you. I saw you last night when I was running around at your little birthday party. I mean, a uh, premiere party, uh, because seeing one up at the Chinese and then walking over to Dave and Buster's for your after party, I think all movie after parties should be held at Dave and Buster's. It was, so <laughs> it, was, it, was it was amazing. And so I went around and I found one of those machines that are just so addictive. It's the I think they're called coin flippers. And basically there was a Star Trek one that they had. And at most places, when you knock coins off one of the shelves, you get points. But at Dave and Buster's, unfortunately, you only get points when you knock the cards that are resting on top of the coins off. And I was obsessed. So I I you scored I had Star Trek cards. Yes, I got the Star Trek cards. I turned them in and I got some thing from the Dave and Buster shop that when I opened today, I got to take back to them because it was missing a piece, but I was fun. And That's I played the Ghostbusters game and the aliens game. And it was very silly. And you have a video game movie and we're going to talk about it in just a moment. But obviously I would be remiss if I didn't bring up people know you as, as a writer, as a director, but you also have some books that have come out in recent years. You know, I would be remiss if I didn't mention them because I love them. Dungeons and Dragons, Art and Arcana, a visual history, which has very early documents from, from the D&D &D sphere in it. 
And I, I just, how did you even get the clearance for some of that? Because I'm sure they've been approached many times, but to be able to kind of go into an archival state like that, I thought was just awesome. It was a very rare opportunity. I played D&D my whole life. It's one of the reasons I got into storytelling. I got back into Dungeons and Dragons uh, 2015. I was playing the Star Wars role-playing game and my game master uh, had to go to Vancouver for work and I didn't want to cheat on our Star Wars group. So I decided to start a Dungeons and Dragons group, put a post on Facebook, got a bunch of friends that some had never played, some had been playing their whole life, found a dungeon master aptly named Thor, a Norwegian ex-military guy, and we jumped right in. And within a few weeks, I was looking for the book that had cataloged everything I was missing because I played intermittently, but really stopped, followed it distantly, and no book existed. There was no coffee table book or lexicon that cataloged the history of the brand. So I put together a proposal. I was like, I'm going to make the book. I want the I, I want to I want to make things that I want to see or I want to hold in my hand. That's what I like to do in movies. That's what I like to do in publishing. And it was no different with this. I said, I want this book. I want it to be the be all end all in the history of the game. And I partnered with Michael Whitwer, who had written a Gary Gygax bio, and Michael's brother Sam, who was my game master in Star Wars. He joined the fray. He was a lifelong player. And John Peterson, who's the most esteemed historian on game history, he also wrote a book called um, Playing at the World, and he wrote uh, Game Wizards, which just came out, and he has a lot of old documentation. So a lot of the amazing letters between people, the amazing old art, we had good leads on everything and could get very good high quality copies that we could reproduce. A lot of things art people had never seen at the quality. There's old scans, but we were able to go back in, rescan. We targeted all the incredible collections globally, tracked down who had the original monster manual, Dave Mandel. Um, and everybody, awesome. you know, pulled resources together and we rescanned, rephotographed. You know, we're able to take fans through the history of the game from its inception in the early 70s out of war gaming all the way up through the birth and growth of fifth edition. And we're actually doing a follow-up to it right now. Nice. Um, and then I also co-wrote the official Dungeons & Dragons cookbook, which was a huge seller, which also we applied our research to it because we had to historically mine the fantasy world and yeah. go through all the old publications, novels and, and manuals, old comics, everything that mentions food in it with Dungeons and Dragons and come up with what is in the larder of all these different uh, races and on different planets and different realms. And we're actually working on something in that same realm too so that's awesome um, I, my, my most embarrassing moment i think was going through that book and realizing that you had an image in there of play D D by yourself that gave me a flashback to being a lonely kid and i ran over to a set of boxes that i have and i opened it up and dug through it and yes indeed i had that handbook of play D D by yourself where you would use an invisible ink marker it was structured like a choose your own adventure and you would highlight which which path you're going to take and it would give you your new instructions and uh yes a lonely childhood but but i also had D D friends but they're hard to find like you know if you want to play D D and your friends aren't available Available, that book was a was a savior, um, savior. and yeah. that, and that's awesome that you have other books going you know a lot of people know you obviously from fanboys in 2009 and we've talked about it before but i just want to get an update because because you and i have spoken just about it over the years i know that you were involved with a script at one point titled chewy Correct. and if you could just give folks a refresher of that and what the status of it is i still think it would make a great movie and i'm hoping even though when you got involved with it, it was at the wrong time in history, maybe now it can hopefully be made or be put on your plate or your side plate or your radar. I, you know, I don't let good projects die. I'm undeterred. Fanboys took years to get made. Barely Lethal took years to get made. The process with 1UP was strangely quick, uh, thankfully quick. But um, Chewy was a wonderful, is a wonderful script. It was a blacklist script. I'd gotten attached to it. We did a little development on it. Give us the pitch. Give us the pitch. It's a mildly fictionalized uh, biopic about Peter Mayhew and his exploits, how he got discovered, how he became this, you know, unsuspecting member of a small family that was making an unfancied sci-fi film in London in, in 1976. And he's there because he has a size 23 shoe and how he has this platonic relationship with Carrie Fisher. And he's this incredible POV into this world, this great fly on a wall, but it's filled with so much heart. 
And, you know, they form this little family and it's sad. Everyone departs at the end and they don't think Star Wars is going to be anything special. And there's this triumphant ending where it becomes something magical that changes all their lives. And it was, it was beautiful. I mean, it, it, it's a script that lets you look at behind the scenes of maybe the most chronicled film in history, but gives you a brand new perspective, a heart filled perspective, very human perspective into it beyond what you've heard about with, with George Lucas or Fox or ILM. And they're all in it, but it's not their film. Right. It's about becoming Chewbacca, but also how it affected his personal life, how it put him on, you know, in the limelight. And I, mean, I don't know. I've always thought it was a cool script. He was working what as is- a nurse in London and uh, he had done uh, one of the Sinbad films. I believe it was a Minotaur and, but he wasn't pursuing acting daily and the opportunity arose and he became one of a cast of, you know, the freaks, the unusual people who are doing these. The, he fit the suit, so you get the job. But yeah, he's a, he was a special man. He was a very kind man and everyone loved him. And it's just watching this chaotic production orbit around this unlikely protagonist. It's, it's a wonderful script. So nothing's ever dead. And my dream is to still bring that to life. Uh, I had a great vision for it. And I think the desire from everyone involved is is has re- been retained and i would love to go back and revisit it you can never say no i i mean these are real life events these are real life public figures yeah. there shouldn't be a ton of things getting in the way for you to make it but just like fanboys it's better to go forward and have the blessing of yeah. lucasfilm than to do it on the side so how does that all work? Because, because I mean, you could be one of the most poised people to make it because of your experience with fanboys, in which I remember that as a script floating around, and nobody thought it could get made because nobody thought Lucasfilm was going to agree to it. But once you broke through that barrier, you you actually got m- more things that you had access to than if you didn't go through the proper channels. So I, I still think something like this could be made in that fashion. I think Lucasfilm was a different entity at that time. Not for better or for worse, but just was different. You know, it was George's private company. And now it is part of a much larger machine. And I'm sure we haven't breached the subject, obviously. There's many more eyeballs on it and many more cooks in the kitchen. And they're also making a lot more content. So they would have to feel like it doesn't step on on what they're doing. But ultimately, like I said, it's a it's a biopic about Peter Mayhew and Star Wars is in the background. Uh there's ways around the the licensed ip and things like that it's really the, what the great thing about the story is it's not about the scenes they're making it's about the people sure offset going home the bonds they make and some of the madness around how their lives change so there's absolutely ways to do it and yeah I mean, you could even do it from within it could even end up as, as something that's on disney plus oh uh, yeah i mean i'm there's open yeah, ways to do it gone down that road i'm I would be open to to any scenario, but again, I wouldn't be deterred. I'm, I, I've made four independent movies now, and you just have to have a very strong will. You have to never accept people's no. It's strange. No one wants to make movies here. They just want to talk about making movies. Right. They don't actually want to do anything. Yeah. You literally have to be a bulldozer, a wrecking ball, and just keep going. And even when you've made the movie, you have to keep going, because then people are like, it's good enough, we're done. And you're like, Hell no, this is not right. This is not right. And you have to keep going and keep people galvanized and positive and giving their all. And I think that's why, you know, like you said, Fanboys was a strange one. No one thought it would get made. And somehow I believed when I read it, I was going to make it. And a lot of people are like, this is never happening, dude. Relax. Uh, my own agents and managers didn't take it seriously until I was like, hi, I'm in New Mexico. We're uh, we're making this. <laughs> and um, they're like, what? <laughs> so I... I just keep going. Um, And if it's something I'm passionate about, I'm going to find a way to have it see the light of day. Well, the last time you were in this series, we we had an in-person screening and Q&A, and it was for Barely Lethal. And I'm just curious, looking back on it a few years later, what would you say was your biggest lesson from Barely Lethal? Something that maybe changed about your creative habit or something that you learned to deal with on Barely Lethal that has stayed a part of your creative habit? You know, I learned something deep uh from every movie both on a production sense and about myself that movie was hard there was a lot uh it was a much bigger budget than anything i had done before everything was on my shoulders 
creatively. And I really needed more help in different departments. You know, I, it's like I had to storyboard the movie myself, doing everything myself. But when you get to that scale of something, you need those extra voices in the pool. I I love collaboration. I'm a painter by trade, I, I would say. And I was like, you know what? I don't want to do this. I want to sit behind a desk my whole life. I want to work with other people. I want to work with these other vocations, be it costumes and architecture and photography and music, all the things I'm passionate about. And I want to work with those people to bring out the best in something. And painting and cinema has doesn't afford me that. It's it's flat. It's two dimensional. And there's something temporal and alive about cinema. And you need those collaborators. You need those perpetrators on your team that are going to just sure. do whatever it takes. With that film, I feel like it, it just needed more infrastructure that the budget, being an independent budget, uh, independent movie at that budget could not afford. There was a lot of uncertainty about its distribution. We initially had a, uh, a smaller independent company that couldn't fulfill its obligations and A24 took the film over. But the, the the transaction in post didn't happen until maybe four weeks before the movie came out. So A24 couldn't really do what they needed to do or what they normally do. It was also part of a direct TV deal. So the direct TV did a lot of this art, which was making this seem like some strange second rate action film. And I had made a PG-13 high school comedy that was really referencing high school movies of the past. Yeah. And so there was this disconnect when we put the movie out. People were like, this isn't like Hannah. This sucks. Why isn't this like Hannah? I was like, who told you we were making Hannah? What is going on here? This is right. not It's not really an action film. And a lot of the things that the film needed were the first things cut. I think, you know, inexperienced money management. And I wasn't, unfortunately, a producer on it, but I won't do anything anymore unless I'm a, a producer. I know how to spend $100. I know where it should go. I will give me every decision and I will make every decision fearlessly. I just need to know the information. What's it cost? What do I need? Where can it go? Where can it be appropriated better? And that needed, we needed to establish the world that our main character came from better. And ultimately it just turned into a 2D animated title sequence, but it was supposed to be a bigger opening for the film to know where, what world she was in, what her skill set was. So then you're talking about the backstory montage. Yeah. So that way, when she does get to high school, there is much more of a culture shock. There's fish out of water. And so that was never authenticated right from the outset in the film. And it was such vital stuff. that just watching this stuff get slashed off the schedule. And everything I've done now has been a 25-day shoot. You know, that was, a, again, a 25-day shoot. And it was a much bigger budget. I can't tell you where the money all went. There's things like this that just mystify me with movies. And so I need vantage into these things because even when I'm making like a video for Taylor, I made a video for Taylor Swift. I did her 1989 tour, everything with Taylor in it. And I was very, very close with Taylor. I was actually living with her at the time. She's like, you want, I want you to do a video. You're done with Barely Lethal. Let's do this video. I was like, great. We picked a song. We just collaborated directly. And like, what do you need? I gave him a budget. And they're like, we have a problem. I was like, what's the problem? They're like, why is your budget so low? I was like, I just, I need 95,000. And they're like, but our last video was like 1.4. I don't understand. How are you going to do this? And I was like, uh, I don't know. What are you? They had like editorial trucks on set, multiple. They were shooting on a psych for four or five days. I was like, who, what? Really? This is, there's so much excess. And I don't yeah. think I come from NYU film school. Everything was independent. Everything I've done is independent. I just think about the bare minimum I need to get it done, to challenge myself, to put me in the box so I can, I can break out. I don't like waste and there's just such an efficiency to doing things. If you have access to all the information and you can, and you can really help plan it, you know? So I like to be involved in all, every facet of the movie from, from inception to release and marketing and, you know, making books is wonderful. I work with Dungeons and Dragons and everyone's like, how would you market the book or what would you do? And it's refreshing because when you make a movie, no one wants to talk to the filmmaker about how to market it. No one wants to say, what are the key moments for your trailer? They all think they're experts and they just go do it. And you're like, I know this intrinsically. Uh, when I'm shooting it, I'm saying, this is a moment for this. This is a moment for this. But it's interesting, you know, in the publishing world, they default to the creator and they actually want their input. In the film world, there's all these different fiefdoms and, and experts and everyone's doing their own thing and no one's, no one's talking to each other. Yeah, that is weird. I mean, that, that's why a lot of filmmakers have gone to TV as well, because they get creative control back a little more on TV sets sometimes, by the way, not always, than, than the feature film world. And of course, you're talking about indie features when you're talking about a quickie 25-day shoot. 
you know, that's that's like what most Sundance films are if they're lucky. You know, a lot of them are 19. And and so each of your movies have been 25 days. Like it like was one up 25 days. One up I shot in uh, 25 days spread between two countries, Canada and, and uh, eight days of it in Buffalo. The budget was sub four million. I did about 52 setups a day. There's nearly wow. 1200 effect shots in the movie. How many effect shots? About 1200. Wow. Every time you see a monitor in the film, it's green screen. So that's everything right. is had to then be um, the 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 interface of the game. It was a crazy production because you have to foresee how it's all going to come together, and you're you're training the actors in a game they've never played. Right, you're teaching a vernacular of the game to an audience that doesn't know it's so abstract. It's not like we have a shorthand like baseball or football. Let's get into that. Yeah. Cause actually I want to, I want to talk people through that. Cause it is really interesting what you guys had to do. So tell us when you first became aware of Julia York's script for one up and started working with Buzzfeed studios and with Lionsgate and kind of how you became involved. And then we're going to ramp up to, to what the film is conquering in the sports structure that it has. It was early, but deep pandemic, August, 2020, a good friend of mine, Tony Burns, who's the exec producer on the film. I had reached out and we previously met with Richard Reed, who runs Buzzfeed studios. And we mentioned, we talked about a gaming movie and then I didn't hear anything about it. And then in August, they said, we're going on this game movie. We want to do it. Julia actually wrote a script. We want to shoot it end of September, maybe October and let's go. And this was maybe August 20th. And I was like, wait, what's happening? I mean, that's insane because nobody was shooting movies. There was, nobody there was, was still, shooting movies. Nobody had a vaccine yet. Like we were one of the, the first vaccine was still not productions right. back back in. I, there was a couple smaller things, but we were aggressively back in in the fall. And for a small movie, it was kind of unusual. But we're like, let's just figure it out. We'll do it. So the script had a really nice foundation for what a story could be a competition set in the collegiate high esports world which, which most was, people don't fully realize exists you know two friends saw brian burke and craig mazin both of them said put a crawl on the movie and i was like really i don't yeah. know i was like 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 blade runner like definitely not like star wars I'm like just do a crawl because we don't we don't believe you that that's even a real sport like tell us it's real and i was reluctant i threw it in the movie wrote something funny and it and it really helps it just validates yeah the whole movie's predicated on whether or not the protagonist v will be able to keep her esports scholarship which is putting her through college and honestly i think brian burke and craig mazer right. were right if you didn't do that some people would be like what you can't go i was reluctant and that's games. that's the process you need these conversations when making a movie i expose fellow filmmakers to my movies early three weeks into cutting i'm like come in people are like you're insane i'm like just come in and watch it i want feedback the whole time and every time i watch it with them i see it through their eyes i bring in different people some that aren't filmmakers some that are just friends some that are kids i just want to watch constantly watch the movie with people every friday and discover things about the movie so i can put ego aside i can put what i anticipated aside and just get to the core of what works all right oh, wait we're gonna hit editing in the spoiler section later so yeah. they're saying so let's go let's do this production it's fall of 20 and i took over i had to do uh, worked with Julia. I had to do some some drafts of the script. And once you get up to, once I got up to Canada, it was, we're going. And I'm casting. And as I'm casting, I write for the people I'm casting. Their strengths. Uh, DJ Mausner was incredible physical comedy. And the character was a little more intellectual and just more bizarre. And I really wanted to ground her in, in a different place. And she really thrives with the physical and just these revealing comments. So I just started to write things for her. And um, Madison Baines, who plays uh, Lily, has just an off kilter sweet side to her with very right and you made her into the deadly assassin comments and so just reworking these characters to suit the innate abilities of some of these wonderful people i was discovering in the toronto acting scene stephen joffe who plays ricardo maybe had four or five lines suddenly he's ascended to a character that's in almost you know every scene the betas are in and rewriting lines for him to really tap into what potential he can bring comedically to set. So yeah, it was like 40 drafts, constantly doing drafts, because I believe that if if your if your script is not right, the movie will never be right. You just have zero chance of winning. So how much time was there in this rewriting stage before productions began? It was about two months for me of nonstop rebuilding, exploring. At one point I had the betas winning and everyone liked that, but I felt like, you know what, spoilers in this, but I feel like there was a trend in movies where the main team would lose like Rocky. There was merits to it because what the real victory is in this movie is what we're saying about female gamers 
gamers that aren't your typical gamer, how they are perceived, what type of opportunities present themselves. And ultimately, in that scenario, the opportunity that will present themselves will present itself to them was the opportunity to go professional. So they could basically bypass the polluted collegiate system. They didn't win, but they got something better, which was a and, stage. Right. To- and that was that was the original draft. And just just to give that, no, that was that was one of my drafts. One I just of the drafts, sorry. And, and so then I went back to it and there was an economy to it, an emotional economy to allowing there's there's a catharsis that happened once the girls uh confront the guys. And that's what you want. And once anything after that, it intellectualizes, you know, you're getting into those intellectual third acts, which are kind of like AI, which I love that movie, but it's a philosophical third act. I don't want to get into anything. It's this is a fun, poppy esports comedy. So I didn't want to overthink it. And my feeling, I go with feelings, you know, how do I want to feel? What do I want someone to feel? That's what I'm, when I'm writing or when I'm picking lenses or anything, it's like, what is the feeling? I don't want to overthink it. Like instinct is almost better than any math I can apply to it. I'll apply that later and, t- and beta test it. But with writing, I just want to feel, you know, and that's kind of collectively what we were doing and finding our way through the story and actually simplifying the number of characters in the movie and the focus on V on a romantic subplot. How much do you go there? How much... How far can you go with the comedy on the guys? What is this, the level of subtlety you can get away with in your antagonists in their sexism? I want to give I want to give people a baseline before we get yeah. too deep into the woods of the story. Basically, V is on an all boys esports team along with Sloan, and they basically have had it with the the way that these kind of misogynistic guys are working. They decide to start an all girls team that they call themselves the eight bits. And eventually the college decides that, okay, we cannot have two esports teams. Whoever wins, you know, this year or does the best in the competitions gets to stay and the other people have to leave. And that would mean that V would lose her scholarship to go to college. So the stakes are high. So that's, that's basically the setup. And it then conforms into a sports movie using the esports arena in which they are competitively playing a video game together which we will get into in in a moment as well but i'm just curious were there any specific sports movies that you had as you know old time favorites that kind of you were coming back to for inspiration when you were getting ready to shoot this you know obviously a league of their own had uh there's a certain weight to that film these different upstarts that come together and coalesce into a very unique team Cool Runnings. I love soccer movies, so I loved uh, Goals, an underdog story. Um, obviously, you watch things like Rocky, and you go back and revisit classic. You got to throw in Victory because Michael Caine. Oh, Escape to Victory is like I was going to get to that one. That one's that one's incredible. Michael Caine, Pele, the whole the whole crew. Beckham Bauer, they're all in it. So I, I was versed in sports movies. I, I wouldn't say I'm like a sports movie fanatic, but I appreciate them. Like sure. I don't like dislike the genre and I love it. And I was like, well, I'm making a sports movie. It's esports that's abstract to a lot of people. Ultimately, I'm making a sports movie and sports movies work on emotion. So even if the, the person watching this movie has no idea what game they're playing, most people don't. Some people are like, oh, that's false. And we reskinned it and we've we've evolved it. And it's a it's a game that's coming out actually in two weeks. It was a game that was abandoned, but then in, in a beta phase, and we took it on and worked with them and rebuilt the game and got the chicken character back in. Wait, we'll you're saying it. it was a game that was actually abandoned that was gonna never be released? That was a question that I had later. I just wanted to I wanted to give people like a sense, like in, in the world of esports, you know, there's there's League of Legends and there's oh, also gosh. Dota. Those yeah. are two very big games where you know, thousands of people are there for these live esports tournaments. Hundreds and, of and, and it's crazy. Yeah. And and so what's interesting is you didn't license either of those games and you needed for this movie as a challenge on a low budget, which is crazy, to create your own game in some certain fashion, which meant that you had a visual effects budget, as you said. Anytime you see a screen, but also think of a sports movie, folks, you can't just show people's reactionary faces looking at monitors. You have to show what's going on inside the monitor, inside the game. So you have this challenge of educating the audience as to what the goal of the game is and what the rules of the game are. And that is that's a lot for an independent film to have video games be so prevalent in it. So. First off, did you ever try and license any game like that was a real game? Or how did you find this abandoned game that you could then take over, reskin, as you said, and use in your movie to your purposes? We had had talks with some of the bigger games. It also felt 
as as empowering as it would be to have the underlying game be something familiar, it still ultimately is abstract to 90% of the people going to watch this movie and also restrictive because suddenly you have to stay within the parameters of what their IP and their characters can do. And I knew immediately I would have to be simplifying the game, its mechanics, and how it would be visually conveyed to make these sequences kinetic and emotionally fulfilling. And that meant there was going to be too many people breathing down my neck saying, you can't do this, you can't do that, you have to do this. And also it's cost prohibitive to suddenly work with say a league of legends and license and do all that and we had a minuscule uh vfx budget so a, a guy ryan stashishan who's canadian based vfx supervisor had come on the project we were shooting up in toronto and he had recommended uh because paragon had developed the game the people behind fortnite and they abandoned their assets they left it out there for developers to go do things with their assets so another company had taken the remnants and created something out of it and we all got excited by the idea of this game it was so unfamiliar it didn't have a fan base that we could make it our own and so we renamed the game and we did things with the characters within it and we were able to reskin them in a way so it would indicate team colors and it was a blessing in disguise it was it saved us because we could then go to the game studio and we would say here's the script of the game after i shot the movie i would have to have 10 people get together and play the game and hit the exact moments i needed for this person power up use their ultra take out this character it's funny that you that you mentioned that because you know again going back to fortnite which i which i love they they occasionally do these movies that are higher res versions than the game of just like character stories and stuff and they're done like a pixar movie or a disney animation movie in which i don't fully know if they're really using players for gameplay but some of the stuff in there isn't even in the game exactly or it's extremely high res versions but you're saying that you were using the 3d architecture of the world that already existed in the engine of the game that already existed that was never released and you had to have players live play out what you wanted to happen rather than animators rotoscoping it one frame oh, yeah time. no i would i would script the games it was just like as i was shooting after shooting we would write this scenario and this is the character lives to this point. This character has to be dead by this point. This character is going to use this power because this is their scene to show off what they do. Everybody has their moment in this script too, especially in the third act where they each get a moment to shine to prove their worth on the team. Right. All of those things were, it, it's crazy. There's movies within movies in this movie. It's its a an absolute puzzle was unlocking in both editorial and in writing. So, I mean, the name of the game that you created was Knights of the Elder Orb. And it, you had a very simplistic concept that people could understand in which there's a big orb. It's almost like a game of capture the flag. One yeah. team has to invade the other side's terrain. And it's just not a flat field. There's little canyons and things to run through and uh, destroy the orb. That's it. Blow up the circle. So you, you made it very easy to understand that didn't require a lot of exposition to get where we were in the game. So, Got rid of things like respawning because there's a lot of that. And then you're tracking who's back in and how long you're in the penalty box for. And some of that I did shoot, but ultimately it all had to be removed in order to say, I don't remember a penalty box. Focus uh, the streamline the game. There were things yeah. like randomly spawning Raptors. There's all these things in the actual game, which are cool, but some of these games take 30 or 40 minutes. And I have maybe two or three minutes of real estate maximum when you're getting into a match yeah. in order to let the drama of a match play out or in a sequence and you every extra idea you you inject into it you then have to see it through throughout the movie it can't just be oh that's cool it happened once so it was taking the game that exists but also saying what is our visual language for the game what can we show on screen that's going to be the new parameters and finding that basis so everyone could understand the game and then it's about how the 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 characters on a human level are reacting to how they're doing in the game. Like, you know, a movie like Sideways, I don't drink, I don't know about wine, I really don't care. But I know when Miles is like, fuck Merlot, I know Merlot sucks. So it's the passion behind that. So in this, it was how are these characters feeling about games? How are they feeling about how they're doing in the game? And then how do I bring life and energy? Into, there's a lot of camera movement. Uh, the third act, it's just it, it, you know, we we get a very different, you know, lighting style in it too, because we're in the stadium setting, and I wanted it to feel as alive as possible for a movie where it's just people sitting behind desks in chairs with wheels watching a monitor. Yeah, um, and that's ultimately what it is, you know. 
but it, it has a special life to it. And that's, I think, because we put a lot of work into on every level, cinematically, you know, photography, production design, and also in game design and, and editorially, how this was going to all work together to create something satisfying and not overwhelming. Because it easily could have been like, what is happening in this movie? Wait, what just happened or what? It was simplistic. You could you could follow yeah. it. And, and, and it was and, it had to be. And and that's and that's good. But it, I mean, it's just wild that you had to make a sports movie where the sport couldn't even be done till afterwards because it was a special Quidditch. effect, yeah. <laughs> you know, on a low budget where low budget films generally don't get a lot of special effects. And we'll, we'll get into that in a second in the spoiler yeah. section. I just want to talk about your casting briefly. Ruby Rose as Parker was, was great casting as, as a mentor in this movie. I loved her in Batwoman. She was great. That show had a lot of interesting twists to it that I did not expect. When did she come onto the project? Ruby uh, got involved before we started production, but uh, there was actually some strange visa issues where, uh, she's Australian, so she couldn't come to Canada and then come back to the U.S. So we kept waiting. Ruby's going to come soon. Ruby's going to come soon. And ultimately, that's one of the reasons I moved production over the border with two days notice to Buffalo, because we needed Ruby in the movie. And so I ended up taking her down from maybe 14 days to sub. You know, we did eight days there. Really streamlined what I could shoot with her. And there's a lot of Ruby on green screen that you, I don't think you'll ever know. Uh, huh. A lot of her stuff, the chemistry is still there. And she's in the classroom with the girls and esports lab and in the stadium. And she's just not. She on physically separate. wasn't there. Yeah. But it, it's seamless. Yeah. Uh, that was a challenge I wasn't expecting, you know, making a 25 day movie and suddenly like you have to add 400 VFX shots. And thankfully I was shooting plates and different angles throughout. Um, so I would have these backup things. So once you knew that she was trapped because of visa problems, you started shooting background plates that you could drop in later for green screen. Locations I knew I wasn't going back to. And people okay. were like, okay, no, that's smart. And I was like, trust me, we're, we're, we're going to be safe later. Let me just overshoot different angles. I need 10, 15 seconds while we're in this lighting. Even if it's just reference for later and we have to recreate a wall or something i, I want to feel and see what the lighting is yeah that's smart the camera here and get it and um thankfully it became our, our lifeblood because she was comped into so many scenes but at at very different angles and different focal lengths so it was it was a puzzle it took a lot of refining again I mean, she was a good mentor it was like a, it was a good was casting call true. It was un it's unexpected, you know, with Barely Lethal, one of the things you what I learned. I just shoot a lot of that movie in block, block shooting because Haley Steinfeld was still a a child and couldn't work the adult hours. So I had her for four hours a day and she was the lead. And ultimately I have to shoot all of her stuff in overs and then, you know, go back and shoot masters right. or the other side of things and get behind her with body doubles and do a lot of that even with the action. And this I was like, I don't want to do that again. I don't want to be shooting. And I was suddenly I was forced to get into a lot of overs because I'm shooting over a Ruby body double in Toronto and then hoping I get Ruby. And I hope it's Ruby because this woman's got a shaved head. <laughs> and then I have to shoot the other side of it in Buffalo. Um, so there was um we had to put a lot of faith into the VFX process. And a lot of faith into just the sheer fact that, you know, in a pandemic, is is she going to be able to travel to us? Because everyone was so dead set on her. She was so excited to come to a comedy and something unexpected. She's a gamer and she has right. leases. Like, I want to do something that they're going to love. She had a lot of fun making Pitch Perfect film. She was just the consummate professional. She came so prepared. She stepped right into it. It was the girls' movie. It was the 8-Bits movie. And she came in and there's no ego. She was like, what do I need to do? How do I become part of this family? She was a, not mechanical in a bad way, but she just knew her beats and could do it. Because I could only shoot one or two takes per, you know, per setup. And it That's was, wild. everyone has to come prepared on my movies. And a lot of people are like, don't shoot your rehearsals. It's like, you shoot your rehearsal. You shoot everything. You never know what you're going to need. Don't be precious. Roll the camera. It's you know, digital. It's funny you say that. What percentage would you say from rehearsals wound up being used in the film? Not, I mean, anything is a win. Like, I would say a lot, but something. I would say like something from every scene was something that was probably out of a rehearsal or um, just letting takes go. And I'm like, I probably don't need this, but just keep going. I, I've got it covered over here. You well, know, so all on stage, I would just do a 15 minute take going through the match. And I would be like, all right, go here. Now we're going to go over here. Now come over here and I come from this angle and do this. And now you say this and you're going, and I would have to walk people through this abstract match and hope everyone, everyone's like, what is happening here? And then ultimately it's all in this one big thing. And I just have every piece I need because if I stop and reset, it's the death it's the death on an independent set. Someone's going to relight. Someone's going to tweak. Someone's going to swoop in and fix the hair. Ultimately, that stuff is is great. You want people to pay attention to that detail, but you need footage and you just have to keep rolling. And if yeah. someone comes to you with a question, answer it while you're shooting. Like you can't stop for any BS. Just keep going. 
And that's, that's, I think, what I've learned cumulatively from these other projects is if you stop to question, you die. If you rethink, you die. The time to do all that is in pre-production. It is in writing. How long did you have for pre-production other than writing? Did you have any rehearsal time with your actors? A couple of key scenes or a date or something. We would get in the hotel room the night before and we would like go through it. But we didn't have any, we didn't have any rehearsal. Okay. Okay. I just felt good when I'm casting about the, the soul of the person. I don't need to see people rehearsing, the, showing me the lines. I don't need to create false scenarios where a male is going to read for a female and throw a character off in, a mm-hmm. re- or in like a casting situation. What I like is talking to an actor for 30 minutes, seeing what makes them tick, seeing what they need as a human to bring out the best in them, filing that away, adding them to the family, just knowing they're a good person, they're going to become a family. Because on all my films, the cast becomes a family. They all still talk on all my films, ba- fanboys, barely leave. Everyone's still tight. And I love the family we created on this one. They are, there's a great bond. And uh, on, a, on a human level, they all are good people that, that like each other and are there for each other. And I think that shows up in the movie. I'm very proud of that. So that's important. And then I know once I understand what they're about and the threshold where they can go as as a person and the spectrum of them as an actor i can push them and get things out of it you know i think hearing them say the lines that i know are probably going to change isn't as informative to me as as meeting them and talking for 30 minutes sure i mean casting again harry neff as sloan for people that are unfamiliar assassination nation was the first time that i had seen neff and i absolutely love that film if you never saw it when it came out a lot of people didn't the release was very difficult uh, for people to understand what the movie was. It's on HBO Max, just sitting there. Sam Levinson, who many people know from Euphoria, wrote and directed it. And it's it's a very gory, violent, crazy movie, but a great movie. And great guy. And he's and, visionary. And I, and, well, uh, and Neff, but Neff did a great job. So when did you get the idea of Neff as Sloan? You know, very early on, I knew her manager. Her name got floated. Jason Weinberg pitched it out there. And it just felt like, yes. I was like, that's her. That's that's who I want. You know, she has a very interesting backstory. And ultimately, with this film, we didn't want to lead with who she is, you know, personally. She's just in this movie as one of the girls. And that's how we wanted to, and that's how Hari wanted to present it. You know, so that's how I identified that's what I am. And so that's that's what it's really about. She's just one of the clan and yeah, and there was there was there was maybe a line in the screenplay that 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 was like a good moment for her, you know, just There's one about- line at the end of Act Two, which is one of my favorite things I put in there, and she just says, um, you know, where, where I come from, there's more Starbucks than people like me. Yeah, and I think it rings true for most people that don't feel like they there's people like them in their small town or they're or they're unique, and sometimes that's why people gravitate to cities and bigger spots because there's more people like them. And here she is on a college campus in the Midwest, and there's no one like her. Yeah, it was for me. It was more, and for and for her especially, it was more important to do as a private moment. It isn't something she would announce to a group of people she doesn't know well. She wouldn't lead with it as the teams coming together. It was just something she's laying on the floor. They're having a beautiful moment. They're they're reconnecting. They're bonding. They're making up, and V says something complimentary to her in an apologetic way, and and Hari, you know, retorts with something revealing. It just felt like it needed to be. It's probably the quietest line in the movie. It's the most intimate line in the movie in the way i framed it really and i needed it to be subtle and then finally lolita molina um yeah. you know who who is a wheelchair user as as a part of the team and i thought that was that was really smart as well lolita was wonderful she did audition um she's based in ohio and she has a presence and a sassiness to her and i knew she could bring to life what we wanted with jenna and also go further with it she's an influencer And she's kind of monetized her disability and she's okay with it. And again, she's just one of the girls on the team. So she had some very funny lines and they all have a superpower, which is themselves. Like I love, you know, Grant Morrison's new X-Men when they're all the freaks are on the team, you know, it's just like the people that are unconventional, you're like beak and stuff. It's like, not everyone has to be like outwardly the super gamer, but like these people are all, they're pariahs in a sense of, you know, they're in their own small town and be with their own family. Her dad, doesn't respect that she likes gaming. And I think that's a lot of people can identify with male or female. Well, right. That's, that's like a central crisis for V, you know, played by Paris, you know, for V, her parents really don't believe in her. And if she loses her scholarship on the esports team, you know, she's going to have to go home with her tail between her legs, you know, per se. And so that that's, you know, the, the, basically the stakes of the entire movie, or at least from her perspective, there's a financial consideration to winning and losing 
each game, which is obviously a problem. Because but it's family it's- dignity too. It's here. Sure. Do, will I go home as a failure to my family after they've been telling me for years, this is a ridiculous conquest I've set out on. So that I think that's where it gets much more personal for her is if it was just about the financial stakes, maybe. But when she does have to open up to Ruby and reveal that there's she'll be disgraced in a way and it's that personal then you understand okay this is why she's getting so passionate about it and she's so hard on the team because how she's been categorized by her own family is is damning so she needs to win on that human level you said your schedule was 25 days the budget was right under four you were shooting i guess theoretically in the delta wave yeah right because so, yeah, toronto said, was um no more than 10 performers on a set it was very extreme and like, again this is fall of 20 this is like november was, uh, december uh, of 2020 uh, november, we started november 1st of 2020 we took a pause over christmas and then we had to come back re-quarantine and do some more of the movie and then cross over to buffalo so you, you have an ensemble cast and you could only have 10 actors on set per scene was that the was that the rules so how did you block that out very infrequently i could get away with the bigger wider shots on stage where you would have two teams behind their consoles with all the 13 green screens and um i needed the announcer there at some points and sometimes i would just see if like people were watching and i'd be like quick step in there and you're a performer (laughs) like you just have to get the shots like for the most part i mean we very rarely did that we obeyed the rules but at a certain point, you're in this place and you're like, well, what's the difference between 10 and 11? It ruins the movie. If I, I can't digitally add this announcer to stage, he needs to be there. This is a wide shot. There's got to be 10 bodies. I don't know how else I'm supposed to make this movie. But crowds, couldn't you couldn't shoot over crowds. It, it just, it dictated a, uh, a style again for the movie. And it meant we had to do more VFX. So you have to add crowds into all your wides. I got to say, your crowd stuff, people have debated crowd stuff in movies for years. But at an at a esports event, you have a dim room. You have a lot of flashing lights you smartly put in a little bit of fog and really the i thought the crowd shots looked pretty good because they were used sparingly they were sometimes over the shoulder from the crowd's pov which was smart and even though i had a sense pretty early on that they must have been digital i i think it really worked i i, I don't think most people's eyes would would you know show that's, anything that's, indifferent that's good to hear i mean when i watched the movie and this is not down to the people who did the vfx work because they were superhuman it's just that we didn't have the time the resources or the money even though i shot a lot of plates to composite to fill we couldn't afford to employ that method so ultimately we're going into like 2.5d type crowd and we couldn't really replace everybody and then have that be matched in other shots where we didn't have the assets right so we had to create a single look or style for how the crowd would be and then apply that to everything so i couldn't use some of the assets we did shoot which was unfortunate because it we could have had even better crowd shots, but it's good to hear that. I mean, when I watch it, there's certain shots where that stick out for me. I'm like, God, I wish we would have been able to finish it. There's so, pyrotechnics on stage and there's placeholders. And I remember it's cost all this money to get this pyrotechnic guy. And you come up and there's these two little like um, sparklers, like six. I'm like, what? This is our, and they're like, oh, it's, it's, that's all we can do because of COVID. And you're like, why did I even need this? And then at the end, we couldn't even paint them out because, so they're just sitting there, these two little sparklers. That's and it's funny. Like, you're like, what are they? Okay. Tell us this about shooting under these protocols. Did they work? Like, was your crew safe? Did you have any yeah, infection no rates? Zero COVID instances on the entire production. Great. That's we great. Were, like I said, we were, we took it all very seriously. Uh, people quarantined and followed every protocol to a T because, you know, you don't have wiggle room when you're making an independent movie. You can't, there's no threshold for, yeah. Mistake. you get shut down for a day. That's a day you never get back. No one's going to, no one's going to give you that day back. So we all were ruthlessly adherent to that, to protect the film and to protect our our schedule. Let's get into the spoiler section. So folks, you know, if you have not yet seen one up, it could also be in your pocket at this point in time, uh, you know, and because it's coming to Amazon Prime. So you could just go into Amazon Prime and watch it. But but if you don't want any spoilers, I would press pause right now. Go watch one up and then come back because we're getting into the spoilers. Obviously, you have a Gen Z movie here. And so what was interesting was it really is the players against the players. It's it's not really against the old guard. The, the one scene that you had with, you know, the adults showing up would be Dean Davis. Davis. Yes, yeah. pr- played played by Chris Farley's brother. I was just dying during that scene because 
you know, the dean of the college when when V goes to to see if she could get her own league uh, sponsored to the college as an all girls team. He he has a recorder that he feels he needs to set and wants everyone to know it's a safe place. He can't properly sit in these bean bags that he's pushed in his, into his office. He's like falling over himself to to try and cater to the silliest stereotypes that that some older people see as being silly of 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 Gen Z. And the girls are just kind of looking at him like you're a buffoon. That, that, that scene really cracked me up and it That's got a good. lot of laughs at the premiere last night. So what, what were the challenges of shooting that scene and, you know, keeping it realistic, getting the goals going, but also really just kind of doing the send up on this completely out of touch Dean who is desperately trying to stay in touch. That to me was the most important thing. Most like you said, it is about this generation versus this generation, but it's a gender comedy. And anytime you're getting into gender comedy and things like that, you, there is that generation that is terrified of how things like this are or can be weaponized and he's a person in an aggrandized position he's the dean of a university he's one step out the door and he wants to make sure he parachutes out of there safely and people coming in there asking for special things is a nightmare is to keep the door open what do you want and like he can't even speak him, him be himself until he hides the cameras it doesn't make sense to him like the world has passed a lot of people by and i thought it was important especially the idea of esports and video games it, it it is absurd to people who are my father's age and people even younger like people are like what that's not a sport what are you talking about and how do you how are there hundreds of universities issuing tuition support for playing nintendo i don't get it you know and there needs to be that perspective on this material because gaming which i wanted this movie to be a testament to generations of gaming you know when i first read it it was just esports and it was very now and i was like that's great but that's a slice of people that's not everyone i don't even love esports the way people there's people that love esports i love games going back all the way to the beginning and i played it all my brother's coleco vision we have nintendo i did atari i did arcade games pinball i would do everything you know i played to the 90s i did the n64 i did every console i played you know dreamcast whatever i played it all a gaming movie has to speak to all of that you know, and where gaming is right now in this new world is incomprehensible to a lot of people that even were gamers back in the day. You're like, what is happening? Well, sure. The mentor of the movie, Parker, you know, she's teaching a class on video game history and, you know, she wasn't even up to speed because she was kind of out of it. And she decides to just kind of go along for the ride to be there to yeah. be their coach, you know, which which was interesting. And then, of course, you have an homage to all the old games in the place that Parker takes them to, which you know, has a Tapper video game in the background. And they watched the 1989 Fred Savage movie, The Wizard, which was great. So, so I mean, like, you you were, like, satisfying the old and the new. And, of course, V to let some steam off is playing an old Game Boy game. Which 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 game was it, though? That's Battletoads, which is considered one of the harder uh, Game Boy games. Okay, because that one I'd never seen before. But it was, but it was funny because she had this bejeweled little you know old game boy with the like the little rhinestones around it yeah and, uh, she was she was playing it on her time off which i thought was cool too one of the tough things about sports movies obviously is where you go with your antagonist so there is a lot of male toxicity in the video game realm unfortunately and you did a version of that that was you know more comedic and broad with with dustin who's the captain of the team the betas you know he's he's just not a nice guy but I wouldn't define him as pure evil, but he's he's yeah. douchey, I think is the the correct term. He's self-serving, he's douchey for sure. And I think Yeah, and and, and, and he is that. a legit antagonist. So tell us some of the challenges of that because really it seems the main antagonism that V's character is facing throughout the movie is finding a way to forge a bond with her new teammates which speaks more to the ensemble concept than really go against Dustin so much in which, yeah, they separate in the beginning when she goes and forms her own team. And of course they face off in the end for the finale, but it seems like really the, the interpersonal relationships with her teammates was the other thing that V was focused more on the challenge of. It's self-belief. Um, if you lean too much into the guys are just awful. Some guys are, are not, team players some women are not team players it's just people can be toxic and in this scenario it was the guys were non-inclusive unwelcoming they were threatened by v but v had to find the self-belief 
she had to be a better team player. And that's the things that Parker teaches her. You can't just put all, all of it on the guys are bad. For anyone to be the best at what they do, they have to defeat some of the bad things within themselves. She had to discover patience. She had to appreciate the family that she created. Sloan says, this is our clan. This is what we always wanted. You know, don't self-sabotage it. Parker says, what's the point in, in gaming if uh, you have no one to, to share it with? You're just a loner, you know, it's a team sport, you know? So it was imbuing it with things that were beyond just guys are bad, girls are great. You know, I go online, movie's not even out yet. I look at IMDb, look at ratings. This movie's getting one and two stars. People haven't seen the movie. No, that's it. Wait, that's important to talk about with online toxicity. The, your movie is not out. It has been no. seen aside from your friends by the people at the premiere last night. And although that was a first viewing, your movie probably was already getting bashed by oh, some of the toxic idea. gamers before yeah. last night. And there's like a Reddit thread. This is just like, go trash this movie, like female Ghostbusters style. You know, I'm sorry like, to hear that, man. And you know what? That's why we made the movie. And uh, I'm not going to sit around and say all guys are 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 great model gamer citizens and they're great team players they're not and i'm not gonna say like it, it, it the bottom line is the community can do better that's why i made this movie it i don't care like where you're from or who you are like it's a video game everyone should be able to play and there shouldn't be that threshold of entry and i want to inspire young people guys girls whoever to say if you love it play it like wear your heart on your sleeve play the games you love and get as good as you can you know, that's that's the that's the format we need for a co-ed competitive sport like this, which esports is. You know, it's not delineated by guys and girls. It's it's a co-ed thing. It needs to be inclusive. So this is why we made it. It's interesting that there there's this um, aggressive trolling of the film because I think if people really watched it, they'd say, you know what? As woke as the movie is, I've had a lot of people watch it. Like that's like one of the most woke films I've ever seen. But it's also offensive. <laughs> like I, it has to. You have to keep it real with certain characters and. Um, and also make it so it's not totally funneled into this idea that the guys are just awful. Like there's for V to be the best version of herself. She has to do certain things and only then will you get there. No one's going to hand you anything. So I still try to keep the messaging as real as possible, which should resonate uh, on, on a, on a sports film level. But it is fascinating that um, people are threatened by a movie that's conceit is just everyone should play. It's really, it's not saying girls are better. It's saying everyone's got a seat at the table. Exactly. Which is unfortunate. I want people to see this. And I think I wanted to make a movie in its DNA that was just as much for guys as it is for women. That's from day one. I said, that's the movie I want to make. I want to make a movie that everyone I know should get something out of it, regardless of your age or your your upbringing or your, your gender or sexual affiliation. It doesn't really matter. Most of you're hiding behind a headset and an avatar. So who goddamn cares, you know? Exactly. Ooh, hey, kids, I'm jumping in really quick to remind you that Backstory just turned 10. That's right. We've made it a decade. We're here. We've survived and we couldn't have done it without your help. And, uh, you know, we want to keep doing it. So your support means everything to us. And now is a perfect time to subscribe because we just released our big summer issue. That's right. We have Emmy contenders ranging from Stranger Things Barry, Better Call Saul, What We Do in the Shadows, Station Eleven, and Hacks. We also have summer movies. We have an interview with actor Glenn Powell, who plays Hangman in Top Gun Maverick. We have John Carpenter, the director of The Thing, on its 40th anniversary. Looking back, there are so many great articles to read in backstories. Huge summer issue. There's also scripts to read. I know you'll dig it. If you've never read us before, you could, of course, test drive us by reading the free issue you, which you could find at Backstory.net on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory. And uh, look, after you check us out and test drive us, I hope you'll consider becoming a subscriber. And just to sweeten the deal, I want to offer you discount coupon code SAVE5. That's SAVE and the number five, and that will save you $5 off a one-year subscription. All you got to do is enter that code at Backstory.net, and it'll get you access to both the iPad login and over at Backstory.net net on a desktop or laptop as well. Look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of all these Zoom casts. That's right. You could watch us do these interviews because they were Zooms that I've put on YouTube on the Backstory Magazine YouTube page. It would really mean a lot to me to have you support my passion project. So thanks for considering becoming a subscriber. But now, without any further ado, let's get right back into our latest conversation with Kyle Newman about his latest film, which you could watch right now on Amazon Prime, One Up. 
Well, let's talk again about your effects for a second, because in in your finale, you have Lily basically start a new chicken character that we haven't seen before in the movie. Or sorry, coming up to the finale. Yeah. And the effects that you put into that look really on par with some of the better movie video game sequences that you see in real games. And it seemed like your team threw a lot into that sequence. The sequence is very crazy and very funny. And it was it was just interesting to see that you were going to put as much virtual firepower into this one VFX sequence that's kind of a joke in which one of your film's characters decides to use a new character in the game and it's a crazy character and it throws everyone off. And you were literally putting the kind of firepower behind the effects that the Lily Chicken sequence had as the final moments of the movie with V versus Dustin. So tell us about that sequence and where that came from. There were two psychological reasons for doing it. One of them was we hadn't been in the game since the very opening scene of the movie. And I knew the finals had to go into the game to give it that extra level of uh, emotional impact and drama. It couldn't just play out on the characters' faces. I wanted to bring that final battle between V and Dustin to life that way. And I didn't want to then have 90 minutes go by in the movie where you hadn't been immersed in the game. So I wanted to get us back into that um, in-game style. And that's where the chicken sequence you know, originated from. It was originally going to be set to come sail away. It was cut that way. It was, it was, it was amazing. It was That's like funny. one of the things I was like my vision for it. And obviously uh, sticks were six are jerks. Um, I'm going to say <laughs> right now, they want a lot of money and um, it, it wasn't worth it. Um, and we had no time and our, there was like a gun to our head in terms of final mix and ballroom blitz was fantastic. So it worked, it maybe even worked better. And uh, sometimes you make those discoveries when when you're forced to, you know, and musically, I'm very proud of, of, you know, the score and the soundtrack, you know, it's just like very particular about those things. I had like a, a, a soundtrack in my head, all these scenes, there's a lot of pop music in the movie, but that that sequence, I was, it was set to music. I added all in my mind exactly how I wanted it to look. And that's what we wrote. And, and um, it needed though to immerse us again into this, uh, visual language so that other scene coming up which was very big and important could be dramatically what it needed to be so that's that's why i was like i need something like this yeah it worked um, and we did spend a lot of time and firepower on it. being able to direct the animation like that was, was great just to be liberated by what i could physically do on a set versus what i can do with a virtual camera it's a it's a tremendous tool i'm a huge animation fan i studied animation and i watch a lot of animation because i have young kids and i've just always been a a massive fan of, of the genre so games and animation just go hand in hand and that was a tremendous opportunity to flex my muscles directing virtually, you know, so somewhere else and we're here and I'm changing the lighting and moving the camera around and coming up with the minimal amount of shots I need to, to tell this, but still give it that big epic feeling and make sure it can be finished at the highest quality possible using the game engine um, and the assets we had at our disposal. But it was like, we had just this many frames, like to the frame. So I had to like maximize every frame because we don't have the money to do 10 extra. It's it's crazy how like to the to the wire it all, all was. Yeah. And it was and it was great that you were able to even afford that at your budget. What, what was something interesting that you learned during the editing process? Because editing is the last stage of storytelling. What were some of the things that you had to cut that were tough to cut? If there if there were things like that, or other things that kind of were surprises in the editing room, you know, surprises. I always want to cut to the bone. I want to find like what is the least I need. It doesn't matter if I wrote it or I loved it or it's my favorite line. Someone said, "What is the least I need." And then I want to go back and add flesh back in the right places. I don't want to keep things for the sake of nostalgia or sentiment. Um, it doesn't matter if I hoped it was going to work. I I sit with the editors and this film had two editors. We didn't start editing. I didn't edit during production. There was no edit. We got somebody on very close to the end just to help with looking at things. So we knew exactly how we could shoot Ruby against green screen in Buffalo. And uh, that was Mitch Martin. And he was fantastic. And Mitch also loves gaming. And Mitch then stayed on and became our co-editor. He kind of handled a lot of the gameplay stuff. So he knew the game and he was good at the effects. So he, I would pop in one room and work with Mitch on the effects and action scenes. And Christine Kim was my other editor. And I just felt like, you know, they, they each had things that they naturally gravitated to. And I love that. So I want to harness that. And Christine was great with, you know, comedy and character subtlety. Mitch was great with this. Then they would flop and we would look at each other's stuff and we would all meet every day and we would like review and check out this scene. And so it became a conversation and a collective. And I would just be there like, like a hawk in every room. I, I think when you're directing, you have to be there every second after you get your assembly. So that's negligence. You should lose your directing license. If you're not, if you're not there in the editorial process, 
what are you doing? Like I, I, I hear stories of direct. I'm like, that is your opportunity. You get a second chance to make the film. Seize every second of it. That's like, just be there and keep trying things. Well, so were you in the same room with your editor or was it during yeah, COVID? Yeah, you were in the same room with, with both of them. We, we had really nine and a half weeks. I mean, it was even less than a traditional. We got a little bit of a late start. It was even less okay. than director's cut. We did get very minimal notes from studio. Uh, everyone was super supportive. Everyone loved it. There's a lot of stuff about tone and rating and a lot of jokes were just, are we, are we going too far here? Are we going to offend people? Are we pushing it too far? Can we be more subtle with this? But Dustin, how offensive does he need to be? There's there's one great line. He was like, vaginas, you know, and they quit the team. And then Ricardo was like doing Nixon vaginas, like vaginas, you know, and it's like, it kept going. It was, it was actually really funny. It was like, we don't need it. You know, there was more at the monument scene. There was more throughout and and you just had to pull back. And it was good getting people's feedback. Richard Richard Reed, uh, who runs BuzzFeed Studios, was just a tremendous partner in this. Can't say enough about how supportive BuzzFeed Studios was and like giving me this opportunity. Richard's a storyteller. He loves it all. He would come into the edit. We would try things out with our montages, finding the right pace, finding the right voice, finding the right amount of information, making sure, sure you're not seeing things twice. It, it's about eloquence and it's about pace. It's about kinetics. And ultimately, it's about emotion. Yeah, you know, there was a, there was a longer scene when they go into the classroom, and that derelict classroom. I want to cut the scene. You know, just being totally frank, I want it to go from they form their team. You have the drum snares. You know, they're like we're doing the team. You know, and then suddenly we get to the monument, and now the guys have reformed their team, and we tilt down from the sky, and we're on this monument, and you meet Jeff and Jeff, and um, but we wanted to also establish that they have this new home base which is this classroom. And it doesn't come back. It's not like it's like Animal House or it's like this Genesis location that becomes a character. You abandon it at a certain point in the third act because they leave campus and stuff. But it still needed to be authenticated. And there was a point where our executive producer was a a unhoused person or a homeless person living under a pile of rags. When you watch the movie, you'll see there's this mound there. And at one point, he wakes up in that scene. And there was a much longer scene. And they have this whole other scary moment in that classroom before we go to the monument scene. And that was cut. There's a little more with Owen earlier. Owen's the love interest. And um, before the first match, he's trying to ask V out. Before he even comes, you know, it's before he comes to the game store later. And ultimately, it was a suggestion again from the producers, like, you know what, maybe we don't, we don't need it because you could misconstrue how he's coming across. Like, there's a relentlessness to him then. Right. Or is he a stalker? Yeah, and this this way, it, it's more organic. He bumps into her at the dance, then he bumps into her at the game store and asks her out, and then they have this very nice date, which I was very proud of the date and the way it's edited. It's like writing. It's like editing. You have to put the work in. You have to go through the repetition of it. You have to keep rereading it. You have to keep reorganizing words. You keep reorganizing shots until finally something feels like it can't be changed. It's immovable because it makes so much sense the way it is. There's just something smooth and elegant and just organic about it. And then you're like, okay, now the scene's feeling right. And that's that's what I try to achieve. And I just feel cuts, frames, frames, frames. And sometimes it's putting one frame back, three frames back, and suddenly you have a different feeling. Like how long do you sit on the quiet moment? But I always want to find that threshold of not enough and then go back and let it breathe. And I think that's what the editor, the editors in this movie were fantastic. And Jessica Rose Weiss, who also did the new Cinderella movie, she's a brilliant composer and we have like really energetic and big and epic game stuff we've got quieter moments and definitely inspired by things that were on like the social network score i wanted quieter human moments things that could percolate electronic things that could also be a touch retro but to never go too digital to let it still be warm and human not too electronic there were these there's comedy scenes there's there's action sports scenes and they have to coexist finding that sweet spot in the musical language was also key and she was just a, a dream to work with i think all you know uh andrea von forced forced music supervisor well i collaborated with her prior and it's great to yeah the music gelled really well connect with her it was like the music gives it a life what would you say your toughest scene was what, what was your toughest scene as a director and how did you creatively rise to the challenge of it? I mean, the entire third act was we had three days to shoot all of those matches. Wow. And, and obviously, we didn't know how Ruby was going to fit into it. We had crowd stuff to shoot. We're using cranes. I've got like a you know second unit. It's not really a second unit, just running around grabbing things for me. I'm running lots of extra GoPros. There was a lot happening. You were using footage from GoPros that were on their computer monitors? For player cams. Yeah. And sometimes I could get away with, especially in the third act, cuts are never really, a lot of cuts are never longer than a second. And so I could, I could get away with things like that in the, 
frenetic pace. That makes sense. You know, like a lot of camera movement, a lot of lens flares inspired by JJ Abrams. It's like, well, how would he bring this scene to life? JJ's longtime producing partner, uh, Brian Burke, you know, we talk a lot and he he watched the cut and gave me advice. But before I even went in, he's like, just keep moving the camera, keep moving the camera. And every day I would wake up and be like, move the fucking camera. Oh, just keep moving the camera. Like, because I'm making a movie that's so static, it could be so static. How do you invigorate it? And so that was just a mantra in the back of my head. It's like, how can I, how can I give it more life beyond what I'm going to do in post, beyond what I'm going to do in editing and music? It's each frame still has to have a, an energy to it that makes sense that pushes you to the next thing. So that was challenged because I'm on set and I have all these people and all this stuff. It's probably the most expensive days, the most expensive rentals, locations, and you can't waste. So I just had to, you know, grab the bull by horns and just be like, do this. We're doing this. We're doing this. And just, you just keep moving, you know? And people are like, wait, what do we, um, we have it. Move on. Like, you just have to know that you got it. I saw, I have it. I saw it in their eyes. I have it. I have it. Unless someone's like, oh my God, I forgot to turn the camera on. Like, and you know, I know now as a filmmaker, there's so much I can manipulate in post. I shoot things a little wider so I can, so I can punch in, so I can add a camera shake. So I can, de- I can destabilize. If you shoot too tight, and you're doing handheld in this movie. There's really no handheld in this movie aside from maybe two scenes. And that was very deliberate. I wanted movement. I wanted life. I wanted it to float. I wanted it to drift. I wanted it to find characters and whip him. But I didn't want it to be handheld. I didn't, you don't need to fabricate energy. You sure. can set the stage for energy to happen in your frame. That was very important to, sh- to just know what I could get away with later in terms of lighting. Lighting's not perfect, but I'm never going to have it. It's never going to be perfect. We don't have the, we don't even have the right tools, the right equipment to make it perfect. Let's, let's stop pretending it's going to be perfect. Let's start shooting. And ultimately everything worked. And I was able to, I felt great that I could manipulate a frame and post to get it to look like something or match something. Even when we weren't sure on set, I just had the faith in myself and, and the post process and my team that we will figure it out. So well, it's, it's going to be interesting to, yeah. to see how gamers discover this because, you know, Amazon owns Twitch and you have references to Twitch in the movie. And so I think I think gamers that have open minds will, you know, discover what you did. And it's not going to be all about toxicity. What's next? Could there be a sequel to One Up? What what else are you working there, on? There is a sequel to One Up that I've been, you know, there's a lot of stuff. That's why those scenes are at the end of the movie. Spoilers, there's some scenes at the end of the movie. They're on a road trip. During the credits. Um, I had planned what would be the sequel. I think there's a lot of room for it. Again, everyone wants to come back and do it. We said this with Fanboy though and no sequels ever happened we're still trying to figure that out that's um everyone wants to come back and do more in that universe but you never know this one yeah it very very well could if, if gamers take to it and it finds an audience and we can make it economically um i would love to work with you know buzzfeed studios again lionsgate team over there they're super supportive they made me feel great when i got on board and jason constantine's a longtime friend and you know he gave me a lot of faith and um just making a movie that i wanted to make that could was it was an homage to many generations of gaming and pop culture and there'd be more of that but it's it's definitely uh it's about them going pro and that's where it would go and and you know and all of your problems aren't alleviated once you get a professional contract and sometimes they're magnified and there was a cut character from the first movie who was a very famous gamer it was supposed to be in it we just didn't have time to shoot it and ultimately it didn't need to be in there the swatting scene was something different that came out of that but that was gone and it still worked and so that character would probably come back and but you know i love everything genre wise i never imagined myself being a just a a comedy filmmaker and i think hopefully the movies i do kind of subvert the genre itself i don't really want to just partake in a normal genre entry i think it has to be a little different like this is a really strange sports film it's also a sports comedy but i love biopics like chewy's a biopic there's a ernie klein script wolfman jack biopic that i've always wanted to make i'm i'm gonna make that one way or another it's it's absolutely that sounds cool unconventional and spectacular right is there anything else kicking around or that's in development right now i know i know you have a music video you directed with your partner sin coming out i have a music video dropping this week music video is uh for sin's forthcoming debut album she was discovered by katie perry and katie perry is in the video got starring which is a great surprise uh so that's fun both the film and the video come out the same day it's just great to collaborate with somebody whose work you love and in the music video space i've always been blessed to work with people i i know and appreciate you know luckily i'm blessed to work with taylor swift lana del rey 
uh, was a good friend. I got to do a video for Lana. Sin is someone that's just incredible. I just believe in her music and get to, to get to do a video with her and collaborate with also Katie. It was just awesome. So I love that. If those opportunities arise, I will always gravitate towards doing that because there's something great about short format and you can just get into the artist's head, find out what they want to do and how to unlock it and tell something special. And it's stripped of all the artifice and you, if you can really work with them directly, it's a very pure process. It reminds me of like making stuff in film school and you just get right to the essence of it and you know what you need and you do it. And we shot that video and, and again in one day, probably 50 setups. People are like, how did you do this? But like, I think I've gotten, I've been so shortchanged on everything I do that I'm just used to making things with not enough and i know what i need and i just i get it done i can't wait for the opportunity where someone gives me more than 25 days to, <laughs> to make a movie uh but it, it's coming like there's a lot of other projects in development which cross genres you know there's science fiction and thriller and period and biopic and i'm working on something that i've been writing for a little bit which is like the dream dream project which is I, I couldn't be more excited about it great so that's fingers crossed is going to come together because it's it's not like anything Did, dare else. i ask if it has a title yeah it's it's you don't have you don't have to say the title if you don't want the untitled monster movie all um, right but it's uh it's 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 um all a lot i love the old universal monsters i love movie history i love the way genres have evolved it definitely references as homage and commentary on it's really about how we discard our heroes we discard our art we're always looking for something better and new and you have these icons like james dean and marilyn monroe and elvis but largely they're irrelevant you know elvis movie makes him relevant again everyone knows who they are but these characters are irrelevant i think it's putting relevancy back in some of the things that were foundational in monster legacies and looking at it in a new way so it's a monster movie but it's really about people I'm going to make a monster if you're going to cry. You know, I can't wait. I can't I, wait. I wanted, I, wanted, I wanted to do all those things. I think movies should be able to make you cry. They should be able to make you laugh uncontrollably. Life does that. I don't think genres should be stuffed into boxes and check these things and you can't go there. You know, I was proud of what we did, you know, fanboys emotionally and like how we handled cancer. And this movie, this was great. Last night at the premiere, people come up to me and tell me they, they, they cried and they weren't even gamers. I was like, that's the best thing I've ever heard. Thank you. You know, I just, if I can make somebody that's not a gamer even just appreciate that other people are passionate about this, that they love it and it means the world to them, then that's, that's like mission accomplished, you know? That's great. Well, look, you've been very generous with your time and I cannot wait to have you back. Kyle, congrats it's, on one up. It's a pleasure, man. Thank you. Every time I listen to your show religiously, I, I love the eclectic guests you get. It's always an honor to be included and come on here. Um, always, always happy to have you back, man. It's the best. It's, the best. You, it's like one of my favorite podcasts ever. <laughs> thanks, man. Thanks. And that's how the Q&A went down. Special thanks again to Kyle Newman for being a friend of the podcast and coming on down to chat about his latest film one up which folks you could watch right now on amazon prime and i hope you do of course while you're surfing around online i hope you also check out backstory magazine we just turned 10 folks we we lasted a decade and we couldn't have done it without your support and we just published our huge summer issue it has emmy contenders ranging from stranger things barry better call saul hacks what we do in the shadows and station 11 we have actor glenn powell who plays hangman in top gun maverick talking about what it was like to be in that incredible film and his process. And you know, he's also a screenwriter. There's scripts to read in backstory. There's also an interview with director John Carpenter on the 40th anniversary of The Thing. There's so many great pieces in our summer issue and we're continuing to add to it. So it would be fantastic to have you as a subscriber. And of course, to sweeten the deal, if you want to subscribe now, you could use discount coupon code SAVE5. That's SAVE and the number five, and that will save you $5 off a one-year subscription to Backstory. You just enter that code into the shopping cart at backstory.net, and it will give you access to both the iPad app and the website. So look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page, which is where all these Zoom casts go. That's right. These are Zoom interviews. So you could watch us have these discussions on the Backstory Magazine YouTube page. It would really mean a lot to me to have you consider supporting my passion project. So thanks for considering becoming a subscriber. The Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith podcast is a copyright of Unlikely Films Incorporated in 2022. 
all rights reserved. Folks, if you want to find me on social media, you could always find me as Yo Goldsmith on Twitter or Backstory underscore Mag on Twitter. You could also find those same accounts on Instagram. So Yo Goldsmith on Instagram or Backstory underscore Mag on Instagram. You could check out our Facebook fan page or you could even send us an email at BackstoryLetters at gmail.com. That inbox gets a little cluttered sometimes. So I apologize if I don't respond immediately, but I love hearing what folks have to say. And I I promise you, I will do my darndest to get to your message. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, the publisher of Backstory Magazine and the host of the Q&A. Thanking you for tuning in and telling you to stay out of trouble. Till next week.